principles of life are those things with which we take for granted but often don't realize that we operate according to certain basic principles that guide our life. Some people call them common sense. Some people call them horse sense. Some people say that they are things that we should automatically do and that somehow we would know them just by the fact that we lived during a certain time period that we would build up experiences and those experiences would guide us and we would learn to do things on our own. You know, kind of like what a parent does, is that a parent becomes a parent simply because a baby is born. Or do they learn by way of once the baby has arrived, they need to do something about it. And so suddenly they're in conflict with what they knew before and they have no classes preparing them for what they now need to learn in order to become good parents. That's what life does to you. You see, life happens. Whether you accept it or not, the reality of your existence is going to go on day by day. Every day that you're alive, something interesting is going to happen. You're going to experience life in a never-ending sequence of events that are going to continually come at you and they are going to confront you with development. You are either going to learn from them or they are going to form you and cause you to become the person that you are. And those are the reasons why there are certain principles in life that you need to learn in order to deal with life. People have often said to me, and I've always been frustrated by the very idea that they say there is no instruction book for life. They say, well, if only there had been a class that someone had given me about how to be a parent. If only there had been some way that I could have known that there's more to life than just simply doing my own thing. But that there was supposed to be this principle of spiritual truth that I could live by and be guided by. And flippantly, most Christians will tell you, well, there is. It's called the Bible. No. You see, lots of people throughout the centuries have taken the Bible and made books out of it. Catechisms, practical guides, devotionals, inspirational thoughts, chicken soup. Mother's Guide to, you know, Proverbs. Father's Guide to Ecclesiastes. Job, of all things. And people, in those respective ideas that they had, were good in their intentions, but wrong in their completions. Because they didn't really bring out to you the idea that there are principles that are contained in the Word of God that bring forth the truth of God to us in a real way that we could live by and we could have as part of our principles of life that we apply so that our life would be a witness and a testimony to something more than just going along with whatever society says is good, but rather we would be a testimony of knowing what is a fact, what is a truth, what is a reality, and what exists for all of time and eternity. Because God is the same yesterday and today and forever. He will never change. He will not change from what he was before creation to what he'll be after creation. In the existence of time, there will always be a constant, and that is God. And so, because God knows all of creation, God has given us principles in life to live by. A lot of those principles in life were portrayed and brought forth in the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts. They were demonstrated to be very realistic in their goals and intentions of causing people to acknowledge that there's a truth about growing up and learning from the mistakes that other people have made. Developing a type of social interaction that's not social isms, although ism just simply means people, so when people say socialism it just means that people being sociable. But it's not about socialism, as some people like to put that in a negative context, but it's about the interaction of relationships that we develop and how to properly deal with them because they are conflicting with us. How does faith deal with the reality of having personal relationships with those that have no faith? How do you deal with the conflict that you have with your own spouse who agrees with you enough to marry you, but you find yourself in conflict in financial matters? in social interactions, in sexual matters, in those relationships that you don't get told how to do, what to do, where to find them in the scriptures, that your church may not feel comfortable about talking about, or that you may not feel comfortable yourself personally about recognizing that there are principles in life that are in play that you didn't know are causing you to act 
in the way that you're dealing with today. And that's why we have the Devote Principles of Life. Because the Principles of Life are simply examining those conflicts, those areas of development that we all, as people, need to experience, but need to also learn from, together, cooperatively, agreeing on certain aspects of conflict and why they happen. How do they happen? Where do they come from? Why are they there? What does the Bible have to say about it? Why am I experiencing things in a negative way when God said he would give me an abundant life and it's supposed to be so positive? Why do people say, well, count it all joy, and then they walk away laughing at you because they don't know what I'm going through, the struggles I'm feeling, the anxiety and the anxiousness and the strife that I feel even though I'm reading my scriptures, I'm studying my Bible, I'm praying, I'm going to church, and yet I'm still in conflict. I have serious issues that I'm dealing with that if I don't resolve them, then I know I will end this, whatever it may be, whatever relationship you may be, whether in job or whether in life, whether in family relationship or whether in personal relationship. Frustrations come when we don't know how to deal with conflict. And that's what the whole idea about the Institute of Basic Youth Conflict was about. It took the idea that there was a maturation of adults that was mature enough to teach children, young people growing up, how to be the next generation. Sadly, we interrupted that. We have a lot of grown-ups who think that being an adult is having a man cave or games or playing the reality of dressing down rather than being man up and own up to their own responsibilities and their maturity that God wants to create in them. Because you see, it's easy for men to slipshod their way through life. And they can do it. Ever since the garden in get ever since the garden ever since the garden in Eden when Adam first passed the buck and said, the buck stops with her, man has been slightly slipping his responsibilities daily by choosing not to observe the things that he's responsible for, that he himself has done, that God has given him authority to be, which is a man created in God's own image, a person who God designed to be a repository of wisdom and knowledge, of relationship, of conflict and resolution of the ability to talk and walk and have fellowship with the living God, of being able to look at all of creation and to name them one by one, even as Adam did. That is what manhood was meant to be, to rise up to the occasion of God, not step down to the occasion of being foolish children playing and singing to themselves and wondering why people don't want to come and party in the streets with them. Because that's the reality of what God intended man to be. To grow up, to mature up, to man up, to own up, to being responsible one-on-one -on -one with the living God. If you don't want that, don't watch the video. I mean, that's the bottom line, is that principles of life will give you the benefit of growing up. Principles of life will give you tools to man up. Principles of life will instruct you in how to take part in your own self-evaluations and to discover or uncover for yourself things that you can apply to your life and your relationship with God and deal with one-to-one -one without having to go through every other person and circumstance in your life and ruin your relationship with other people because they have no idea what's going on inside of you and you're not too sure about what the conflict is inside of yourself. And it's not psychological. And it's not sociological. In reality, it's relational. And it has to do with the area of conflict that you're in. And that's why we have, and we use as our textbook, the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts. And we've gone through several of these. And we said we'd mention it at times, you know, going through it and talking about it and, you know, giving the foundation of why we're using it. Because it does come from Scripture and it's a Gothard Ministries and all those kinds of things, you know. And they're very good, but they're just foundational for us to use. So. We use it as a foundation, but we discuss it as a realization that everything is applicable to a person by way of the Holy Spirit teaching and guiding. And so we ask God that you would come now by your Spirit and teach us and instruct us in the way that we should go so that we would have ears to hear not only what your Spirit would say, but what we may be realizing in our own conscience that's been programmed 
incorrectly, but now you're teaching us to listen to it correctly, to the realization and the knowledge that we ourselves must change in order to adapt ourselves to hearing you more clearly, doing what you want us to do more succinctly, and being able to follow you all the days of our life. We need to own up, God, to who we are. We need to man up to what we want to be. We need to find, oh God, that you are teaching us this day that we can have principles in our life and we can be a man of principles and not just a child tossed to and fro with every whim of doctrine and dogma that comes around the world and seems to make everybody feel better, do better, and act better, at least on the surface. But God, with the inner conflicts that we have, we ask your spirit come inside and deal with those things that we know you abide in us so that when we're done, we would find the spirit of God without us causing us to be made manifest all around us, that this Jesus himself is in us, around us, and about us, teaching us the way we should go. And so I love to look at, over and over again, the manual, the book, so to speak, the areas that I need to grow in. And one of those areas that I really need to practice and I practice regularly and I deal with on a consistent basis in my ministry as well as in my personal life as well as my questioning myself when I look in the mirror is tracing problems to root causes. Because you see there's always a problem. There's always a problem. Somewhere at some point in time, you're going to come up with a problem. But what you want to get to is the root cause. The root, whoops, let's do this. You want to find the root cause. Everyone in life, whether politician, whether prophet, whether priest, whether minister, whether teacher, whether yourself, it doesn't matter who it is, but everyone has an opinion about everything. Everyone has an idea about anything. Most people will come off and tell you their ideas, their thoughts, their concepts, their principles, the things that have influenced them and that they have found to be true in their life. What I want to do is I want to give you a good example of how this works, this problem and root cause, and how it can sometimes destroy friendships, how it can ruin relationships, how it can really cause people to look at the wrong thing, the problem, and forget all about the root. And I want to deal with it in one subject that's very personal to a lot of people right now. And you'll see what I mean as soon as I put the word up. <laughs> Because people really get all in a tizzy and a tiver and shiver and jump up and down and get excited and scream and shout whenever this topic comes up. Abortion. Interesting, isn't it? Because if I say the word abortion to you right now, immediately thoughts of legalization, thoughts of changing society, thoughts of women's rights, thoughts of the body, the baby's rights, thoughts of everything comes up about abortion and about this topic that we look at, that supposedly we know what the issues are. The issues are the right to life of a womb and a baby, right? The right to have full gestation of a sperm and an ovum to come to completion so that that sperm and ovum would become a life. That is the problem with abortion, right? Because it's murder, it's the termination of life. Isn't that really the root cause of the problem? Or is it? You see, you and I could argue all day long about what a woman's rights are. Couldn't we? We could say, well, the woman is the house and the temple of God so she can do what she wants because she's the temple of it and she's keeping it in her body and it's in her body after all so she gets the choice to eat what she wills drink what she wills and do what she wills with her body and then someone will come along and say no you can't I'm sorry but you don't have the privilege of keeping your own kidneys 
I can make that decision for you. You don't have the right or the privilege of keeping your own lungs. I can make that decision for you. You don't have the right to keep that life inside of you because I can make that decision for you. Or can I? You see, the arguments come back and forth and create this massive, really unbelievable conflict. Where both sides of the issue, people are saying, oh, well, I can do this, 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 and this, and this. And the other side of the issue says, I can do this, 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 and this. And they argue about the problem, but not the root cause. So think about this with me, if you will. This is an example of looking for and trying to find root causes to problems that we go through. What's the root cause of a, an abortion? But, come on now, come on, you can give it to me. I'm sure you know, you know, what's the root of an abortion? Pregnancy, correct? Right. Someone, at some point in time, got pregnant, didn't they? Oh, yeah, well, now we're getting closer to the root, aren't we? You see, the problem that we have with abortion is that we're looking at the problem which has come up about whether to keep the baby or not to keep the baby, whether the baby has rights or privileges, whether all of these things exist because those are the things that we see right now, but we don't look at the root cause of what made the issue come forth as a problem. If this was dealt with, do you think there would be an abortion? What's the root cause of abortion? Pregnancy. Someone got pregnant. Now, let's be honest. Do you know of any men getting pregnant? No. So, of course we blame the woman because she got pregnant. Or did she? You see, that's the whole issue of where a Christian will find the Spirit of God telling him what to do or the intellect of a Christian telling him what to do. You see, the Spirit of the God, Spirit of God wants to get to the root cause. He wants to reveal the truth of where all of this problem about abortion exists. Because most people would rather deal with the surface issue and just say, oh, well, we got to legalize it. Oh, no, we got to illegalize it. Oh, no, we got to shut down clinics. Oh, no. And, of course, when they put these band-aids over the problem, they don't deal with the root cause. They just simply eliminate one of the ways that abortions performed. They still have more problems because it still goes on. Making it illegal or making it legal would not eliminate the problem of abortion at all. None whatsoever. It might make it harder, and some people would choose not to do it, but it would not eliminate the issue. The issue is pregnancy. Now, let's just go back a little step farther. Is pregnancy the root cause, or is that still a problem? You see, when you start dealing with root causes, you need to get down to the nitty-gritty and the honest truth of where the problem starts from. And let's get real for a minute. A, no man can get pregnant. B, a woman got pregnant. A, can a woman get pregnant without the man? Yes, of course she can. Ah, so, is it about pregnancy or is it about the participation of a man and a woman? You see, that's where we start getting to the roots. When we start getting to the roots, we see that there are a couple of things that could be true. A, a woman could have gotten pregnant by artificial insemination in order to have an abortion. Or she may have, quote unquote, changed her mind after she got supposedly artificially inseminated and then decided, oh no, I've changed my mind. Now, I don't know about you, but common sense, as well as my spiritual sense and God sense is telling me, eh, ain't going to happen that way. Because if a person goes out of their way to pay for experience and go all the way to the point of being artificially inseminated in her ovum with sperm, then it seems to speak to me that her intent is to have a baby, not to have an abortion. So, usually, most people that go that far, if they are artificially inseminating themselves, are looking to have a baby. So, you see, it's really not about artificial insemination. 
And you notice that we're kind of like eliminating all the problems, you know, and all the surface issues because we're zeroing in on somebody who's at fault. Now let me ask you this. Just to get to the root, to get to the seed, so to speak, of the plant that grew here, literally, how many women do you know that can have a baby without sperm? No, seriously. Has anyone ever yet created artificial sperm? No? Oh, okay. So, no one yet in our society, no one yet in time and space has been able to create artificially sperm without there being somewhere from someone named a man in his genetic material that he has donated his sperm in order to create artificial sperm if there is such a thing or will be such a thing in the future but that somewhere they had to have gotten it from someone and it had to have come from someone in other words when there's a pregnancy there has to be two people involved the recipient correct and the donor the donor is the man initiating his seed into that womb that receives the fertilized egg correct am I correct or am I incorrect you see that's what you have to ask yourself when you start looking at abortion and you start blaming women you need to look back at a little farther in history and say wait a minute where did the man go wrong here where did the man's part get suddenly skipped over hidden from and oh well we don't talk about that the question on abortion is that do you do a DNA test to find out who the father was no, of course not. Why not? You see, if the woman was guilty of abortion, how come the man's not involved too? Good question, isn't it? You see, if you pass a law that says abortion is illegal and that committing that act is murder, then duplicity would be the man is also responsible too, isn't he? And accountable. So somewhere we have gotten off of root causes and we've dealt with problems and made more problems by trying to make laws to cover problems than to cover root causes. The Bible deals with the root cause, in case you're wondering. The Bible already discusses where and who is responsible for abortion. It always has. There's never been a doubt as far as Leviticus was concerned in the regards to what a man's responsibility was regarding his seed. His seed follows him wherever he goes. He is responsible for that possibility of life that comes out of him and either spills upon the ground, which was an abomination to God as far as some of the nations that were doing that, which is what the, I, the whole definition of masturbation is. God saw that as an abomination. Or are we accountable for that issuance of life that comes from us and are we owning up to the responsibility of what we do when we do it and how we do it because you see in order to get a person pregnant you either had to participate with that person or you had to donate your seed or your sperm in some way for that person to conceive life and to have life to create the problem and that's why we have to deal with in principles of life getting to root causes there's so much smoke and mirrors on top of this abortion issue, no one wants to get to the root cause at all. They don't even care who the father is today. They don't care who's really responsible. As a matter of fact, that same person could be creating all kinds of problems, couldn't he? Because he's what? Fornicating. He's using the opportunity to sin and the consequences of his actions have created a problem for society to deal with. The consequences of his actions, because if the man did not commit sin in the first place, there would be no abortion, would there? The man, if he did not participate in fornication or somehow creating in that woman a fertilized egg, then the reality of the problem would not be society's fault, it wouldn't be the woman's fault, it would be the man's responsibility to deal with as he is supposed to, because after all, he is the one who participated. Now, I'll give you a 50-50 if you want to play, you know, kind of devil's advocate here, although I don't like the idea of a devil's advocate, 
But if you want to negotiate, let's just say as an equal partner, then we could say, yes, the woman participated in fornicating with the man. Correct? And so the fruit of their womb, the fruit of their joint venture is sin. And the sin has been passed on to all these generations having to deal with the question of abortion because now to cover their sin they commit murder. Interesting, isn't it? To cover their sin of fornication, they create this observation of abortion to do something to the consequence of their action so that they would have a covering over what they've done so that people would deal with the issue, not the problem. That's what the issue was in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve knew they were in sin once they had eaten of the apple. Then they tried to cover the fact. Adam did, by blaming the woman. Interesting. The whole idea of abortion probably was a man-made idea. It probably was some man, some point in time, said, hey, I didn't do it, she did it. And sure enough, now society is dealing with it. And that's what the problem is when you and I, personally, in principles of life, don't deal with root causes. If we don't take the time to step down what we personally have done, what I have done before the living God, and admit my own sin, then I'm always going to wonder why I have to be at odds with people on both sides of this issue because of the problem. So you see, you may have a problem in some area of your life that you don't know what you're doing with. You don't have a complete appreciation that the problem is not the issue. The problem is the root cause. And that you need to get down to the roots in order to find out what the real issue is and what the real problem is with what you're doing and how you're going to resolve it. And that's what we're going to do in this two-part, maybe three-part, four-part, five-part, who knows, of root causes. Because just taking this one example, you saw how complicated abortion is. Abortion is not the question of women's right to a body, is it? The question isn't society's right to make a law about a woman's body. It's not the issue. The root cause is the problem of man and woman basically screwing around and coming up with a problem that they need to deal with. And when they decided to deal with the problem, they created a new issue, a new problem. So every time you try to solve a problem, rather than solve the root cause, you create another problem. Do you get that? When you try to solve a problem, you create a problem. Because you can't solve a problem. The problem has a consequence. When you try to solve a root cause, then you solve the issue. That's the difference. You always have to come back to the root cause of what is the conflict? What is the problem? What is going on in your life? And you can take this approach, as we'll see, and show, as we're going to go through step by step, how to identify or how to trace problems to the root cause. It's always interesting to me that, you know, in this one, this illustration that they have in here, they give a four-step approach to get from the root cause to the root problem to the surface cause to the surface problem. So there's always, in my mind, three parts, but for the sake of brevity or shortness, because I could go for seven parts, you know, and really get into it if there's a bunch of classmates here, you know, we were giving a big lecture and I had time to prepare the seven-part step of how you form habits and how you form methodologies and how you form thought process and how you deal with those things and how they become actions and how your actions become words and how your words become intent and content and how the content and intent becomes portent and the portent creates the problem that you have and how you could break that down and change that from one step of the chain of process that you go through and realize that that's what God does when he inspires us, that he can change us at any point in time in that process of development that we're developing in the wrong way, that he can change it to the right way. And that's what's interesting to me about the principles of life. There is a process of maturation that we need to appreciate. And that's why I'm trying to stop here now rather than go on with it because you've got to get the two-step dance down. 
Two steps. Very simple. Problem, root cause. That's what you need to be thinking. What you should do is see if you can figure it out. This is probably one of the more complicated, and yet it's so simply solved. One of the more complicated social issues and social ills of our society today, abortion. And yet, the simple solution is basically this. For every aborted fetus, castrate the man. When castration, guess what? There will be no more abortions. Because men will take seriously the responsibility of their fornication if they are required to give accountability for their DNA that exists inside of a woman that she went out and caused an abortion. Now, when I say castration, I mean that you put it on the books, but you don't have to follow through. The judge is the one who determines in society themselves the circumstances of how it applies. And in other societies, they already do that kind of thing. But if you made it accountable, if you began, besides the castration part, let's get on to you know, more of an American version of that. If you made, and you could pull up the DNA from a aborted fetus, and you threw that person in jail, meaning the man and the woman, both parties would think twice about what they were doing. Because they would no longer consider it just a frivolous act of fornicating, but that they have an accountability for the action that they're doing in case there is a reaction of giving life and causing that to happen. Because you see, the man at any point in time, he could have had quote-unquote safe sex as though there was something safe about it, but he could have taken care of the issue. He could have caused there not to be the possibility of the conceiving of life by what his actions were. So when you go back to the root cause and you start to deal with the man involved, you'll find that the solutions will come fast and furious, quickly, as men will begin to change, not, not abortion laws. They're not going to do anything about that. They'll never solve it. It'll always be going circle within a circle within a circle, because it's just a rat race of blame game going around and around and around. And they'll never come to a perfect conclusion that anybody will be comfortable with. But when you finally get to the point of you're dealing with the root cause of it, the man, then suddenly, you know what? Hey. He thinks twice about what he's doing before he wants to pay for the consequences of his action. Most people don't want to, and that's why the root cause is always, in any Bible study, is the most uncomfortable place for a Bible study to go to. Because root causes always deal with you. Yeah, you. The root cause deals with me. It means I stand naked before a holy God and he tells me exactly what the cause is. And I can find in every root cause, I'm the culprit. I'm guilty. I did it. Somewhere, some point in time, whatever the conflict may be, whatever the problem may be, somehow the Bible always points back to me as being guilty. Me as being the one who missed the mark, who sinned, who did the wrong thing, and then because it was so deep involved in my soul or I postponed it for so long to deal with it, I got all carried away with the problem of it rather than dealing with the solution to the root cause of how I got there in the first place. That's why we need to take that two-step approach. That's why you need to think on these things for this time period until the next principles of life. Think about when you have a problem are you dealing with the surface problem or are you dealing with something that's a consequence of some other root cause that took a long time to get there but guess what the problem on the surface now isn't what the root is and so you may solve for temporary solutions the problem temporarily but if the root is still there the actions are still going to happen over and over and over again you can't solve a problem just by dealing with it. You have to deal with the root cause. And that's what the principles of life will help you with. So, Father, I thank you that you've given us a way to look at life. You've reminded us that there's always more to what we can see, what we can hear, what we can touch, what we can feel, than just the things that are on the surface. Oh, those are easy to react to, God. And we thank you that you've given us emotions to react that way. But God, you've also given us intelligence. You've given us 
intellect. You've given us inspiration. With those three things in mind, O oh God, give us your spirit so that we can learn to look at the root cause of why we do the things we do as opposed to why we react always to the surface problems and we don't take action on the root causes. Help us, God, to just, at least at this time, maybe not solve the root causes, but help us at this time to just know what the root causes are, even though we may not be able to solve it yet. Even though we may not be able to admit it yet, help us to at least see, O oh God, the root cause of any of our problems and just help us so that we know to understand that in just a little bit of wisdom that you've given us. Help us by your ability to open our eyes to see it. Because, Father, without there being a principle of life to live by, God, we just go wherever we will. We do whatever we feel like at any point in time. And the consequences of our actions catch up with us and we have more problems than we have solutions. So, God, help us just to see, just to know, and just to begin to understand the root causes to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Cool.